Africa. Former Disney Corporation board member Roy Disney was one of the featured speakers at a conference on corporate governance. It's hosted by the Council of Institutional Investors. This segment's about a half an hour. Thank you very much for your patience. I don't want to waste any more of the speaker's time, so let me just promptly introduce Roy Disney. Thanks very much. I told Ann that's a really short one. It's Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I deeply appreciate this opportunity to be, appear before one of the nation's most respected shareholder organizations, the Council of Institutional Investors. Two of my colleagues are here with me today, Gene Krieger and Michael O'Connell, who are down here somewhere will join me later. Each of you in this room is playing an integral role in the reforms that are presently and hopefully taking place in our capital markets. And I say this regardless of whether or not you supported our withhold campaign at the recent Walt Disney Company shareholders meeting. I hope you did, of course. During the last 60 days, without exception, every CII member with whom we met and took the time to listen, consider, and evaluate the situation fully as it was presented to them. You all had admirably fulfilled your fiduciary duties and for that, you should be proud and your benefactors, your beneficiaries, satisfied. In addition, I personally deeply support, appreciate your support. I hope my remarks this morning will provide further insight and context to not only the ongoing situation at the Walt Disney Company, but also to the critical dialogue regarding the relationship between the owners of public companies and their stewards the boards of directors and management teams. Before I go any further, though, I should probably give you a disclaimer. I am anything but a dispassionate observer in all of this. <laughs> to say that the Disney Company is any less than a part of my blood would be an understatement. I do, however, understand that I'm in a room full of dispassionate observers, so that's the last you'll hear from me on the subject. Well nearly the last, anyway. The Walt Disney Company. What happened on March 3rd in Philadelphia? What was the process that led to our decision to create SaveDisney.com and initiate the withhold campaign? What was the vote, was the vote effective? And how might this affect a, a corporate democracy in the future? Perhaps in a curious way, more than any other high-profile stories of the past few years, more than Enron, Tyco, or WorldCom, the Disney situation encapsulates the many and varied challenges confronting boards and shareholders alike in today's very public corporate environment. And this is why. In the absence of outright fraud or severe financial distress, the critical question is, what does it take for a board of directors to act? Most companies don't have a scandal or a fraud to shock their boards into, into action, although certainly most would agree that if those boards had been doing their jobs, those scandals would never have happened. It's also true, however, that boards must act long before a crisis for long-term shareholders to be best served. One of the most fundamental and important duties of a board is to monitor and hold the chief executive officer accountable for the long-term performance and strategy of a company. To do this, a board needs basic knowledge of the company's business, complete facts, and understanding of the kind of leadership required by a company at any point in time, and most importantly, the courage to act independently and without fear of reprisal or dismissal. The power of the incumbent creates significant inertia for most boards. About three years ago, my longtime business partner, friend, and fellow board member Stanley Gold and I began to believe that fundamental change was necessary at Disney. Financial performance had been declining for more than five, well more than five years. 
certainly more than enough time to evaluate performance and strategy. To be sure, having been presented with optimistic projections that often later failed to materialize, Stanley and I had supported many of management's initiatives. But these shortfalls had to us become too significant to continue to ignore and accept. We believe that a board has an oversight function that on the one hand requires latitude to be given to senior management, and on the other hand, when significant strategies regularly fail on execution, requires the same board to reevaluate management and possibly replace it. Thus, the key question we faced by 2001 was, what should we do now? Our choices were pretty limited. We could do nothing, we could resign, or we could try to effect change from within the boardroom. We chose the latter, and we spent more than two years trying to persuade other directors that the company was in decline, both creatively and financially. We wrote letters and position papers, we analyzed historical financial performance, we made constructive situations, suggestions, excuse me, to improve board information, and advocated substantive governance reform. Unfortunately, we faced a board that simply deferred to management or was unwilling or uninterested in a dialogue on the critical issues. They sought consensus and were frankly intolerant of constructive dissent. This conduct appears to be all too common within the boardrooms of corporate America. Then on Thanksgiving weekend of 2003, John Bryson, chairman of the nominating committee, informed me that I would not be on the slate of directors for the March 2004 shareholder meeting. At that point, my family and I had another decision to make. I suppose I could have gone quietly into the night, enjoyed my four kids, our 16 grandchildren, and savored the memories of nearly 70 years of contributions to a great American company. But I couldn't bring myself to just walk away and abandon talented people, many of them good friends, who dedicate their lives to making the Walt Disney Company an American icon, as well as a profitable business. Of course, I also have an obligation to my family's long-term investment, which creates a strong mutuality of interest with many of you in this room. Because I knew Michael Eisner, I knew he would use the resources of the company to protect himself. I knew the difficulties the board would have in challenging and confronting him. Recent reports, unfortunately, confirm my instincts. The board needs to ask itself the value to shareholders of the millions being spent on political lobbyists and consultants across the country. These efforts and expenditures are shameful. They have little to do with inspiring creativity, and the board remains quietly acquiescent at best. Michael Eisner is behaving like a third world dictator of a once great country utilizing political carrots and sticks to manipulate the electorate. And his cabinet sits mute for fear of beheading. I'll let that sink in. <laughs> but if change was what we wanted, financial fundamental change, we were right back to the original question. What would it take? Of course, we chose to fight, and as you know, the results of the vote were unprecedented in the animal annals of American history. The process was an uphill fight. Without our own very significant financial commitment, the dedication and hard work of Shamrock's employees, an enormous number of volunteers, the advice of our lawyers, press relations team, and proxy solicitors, our high-stakes gamble would have quickly fizzled. I've never run for political office, nor, nor, by the way, will I. <laughs> but I can imagine what our team experienced over the last 90 days came close. Since March 4th, I've thought a lot about what led to the result and arrived at what I think are the primary reasons. First, I think our passion and our tenacity stood out. Second, our message rang through the simple story of very poor long-term performance 
and a weak and disengaged board were compelling. And third, even though I promise not to mention it again, there truly was a high emotional content to the vote. A deep feeling, especially among individual shareholders, that the Disney ideal, however they defined that, had been somehow betrayed. Here are the results. 43% withhold against Michael Eisner, 24% against George Mitchell, 22% against Judith Estrin, 22% against John Bryson. All these results, of course, include so-called broker non-votes, without which the numbers are even more startling. Notwithstanding these stunning statistics, the board took only the lame step of separating the chairman and CEO roles. This was very nearly a non-event, a move to mollify the shareholders by interpreting the vote as just a governance matter. But let's look at it this way. Broker non-votes aside, over 50% of the votes actually cast were against Mr. Eisner's incumbency. Nearly 30% of the votes actually cast were against Mr. Mitchell. And absolutely nothing changed except that Mr. Mitchell was promoted to the post of chairman. So once again, what does it take? The numbers suggest a clear message was delivered, but limited action was taken. What will it take for the board of the Walt Disney Company to listen and to act? There's very little doubt that change is necessary. We've heard that over 70% of the participants in the company's 401k plan voted against their leader. These figures confirm my long-held concern that the morale among the company's 125,000 employees, many of whom touch our guests every day, sits at an all-time low. Only through dedicated, committed, and creatively inspired cast members does a company like Disney thrive over the long term. Without the support of its employees, how can this CEO get the company back on track? The board can't underestimate the impact of Michael Eisner being a lame duck CEO. Common sense would tell you, especially at Disney, that employees are the greatest assets of the company. When they're abused or exploited, it's the shareholders who suffer, not an isolated management. Is the power of the incumbency that strong? The incumbency clearly gives control of the process such as the tabulation of the votes, control of critical information, access to human resources, and of course, access to corporate funds. I know what we spend. I won't tell, but I know. <laughs> I have only to imagine the millions of dollars of shareholder funds that this management team has spent and continues to spend to defend themselves against the will of their owners. Nevertheless, we believe it's inevitable that we will see a new leader at Disney. The key questions and issues between now and then are, first, timing. When will the board find the courage to do what's right? Second, how? Will the board go through a thorough, professional, and dispassionate process to select the next leader of this American treasure called the Walt Disney Company? or will they meekly take instructions yet again? Third, short-term versus long-term. What will be the longer-term cost of any short-term business decisions management takes this year as they chase every penny of earnings? It's my belief that the CEO will aggressively seek to protect his position. These costs, though, are real, and who will bear them is the real point the board must consider. And fourth, board transparency. Will the board begin to fully confront the series of legitimate questions to which stockholders seek answers? Or will they continue to allow management to spin half-truths and incomplete facts to the company's owners? As I said earlier, we're firmly convinced that at some point soon the board must act. It must acknowledge the vote, it must acknowledge the outcry from shareholders such as CalPERS, New York State, Ohio State, Wisconsin, CalSTRS, 
TIAA craft, T. Rowe Price, Fidelity, not to mention both sides of the Disney family. It must acknowledge the comments of respected governance experts such as Robert Monks and Peter Klapman. It must acknowledge the reports from the proxy advisory firms ISS and Glass-Lewis. So I ask again, what does it take? At some point, the board must acknowledge 10 years of declining performance. It must acknowledge the failing strategy of current management. It must acknowledge the lack of season depth among the executive team. And it must acknowledge the declining working conditions and poor employment mortal, morale. More importantly, it must acknowledge the major failures of the ABC network, operating income losses of a billion dollars over the last six years. Go.com, a write-off in excess of a billion. Fox Family, our best estimate is that today this property is worth four billion dollars less than that paid for it when it was purchased. The Disney stores, our best estimate is that the division will have lost approximately a hundred million in the last several years. Disney's California Adventure, cost in excess of a billion, contributed to, to a decline in operating income at Disneyland of approximately a hundred million. A true lose-lose. And lastly, it must acknowledge the long-term cost of the failed partnership with Pixar and all our good friends there. In total, these mistakes of the last five years alone have cost shareholders over seven billion dollars. And yet somehow the shareholders are expected, as Mrs. Estrin suggested yesterday, to simply look past these indisputable facts. The board cannot allow management to hide behind years of significant failures because of two good movies and an accounting change which are driving 2004 growth. Here again, what does it take? How many years of significant failures and how much capital must be squandered before a board acknowledges that new management is necessary? Additionally, and perhaps more troubling, is the recent change in management's public comments regarding growth in 2004. In early to mid-February, management began to insert the words continuing operations into its growth forecast language. Moreover, we heard Ms. Estrin talk yesterday about earnings growth of 25% in 2003 after non-recurring items. I contend gap earnings growth of 8% is what matters. It is what the company puts on its website and those non-recurring items happen to be real cost to the shareholders that simply cannot be routinely ignored. This rhetoric of continuing operations sounds eerily familiar to the pro forma language of internet CEOs in the late 1990s. Has it been that long ago that we forget the danger in looking at anything but gap earnings? I hope not. Perhaps the current SEC proposal regarding shareholder access to the proxy will put real teeth into this message, but today shareholders have only the goodwill and integrity of the board of directors to rely upon or have faith in. Now I'd like to turn for a few moments to some of the key issues currently being discussed regarding improvements to the shareholder board relationship. It's my belief that sadly for the shareholders, the pro proverbial pendulum remains well off center in our capital markets. The costs of business embarrassments, scandals, and frauds have been much too high and much too frequent. Fortunately, reform is possible. First, I support open access to the proxy. Whether it's the current proposal or a more liberal one, the cost to the shareholders of access are simply too high without reform in this crucial area. To us, this is more important than all the other reforms being discussed, underway, or already implemented combined. Second, we agree with Ann Yerger of CII who stated, broker non-votes have no place in a modern voting system. 
Third, the requirements that ensure that boards of mutual funds recognize for whom they work is critical. I recently read about one individual who sat on the board of 287 mutual funds, and we wonder why investors are concerned and unhappy. Fourth, communication between boards and their owners is vital. This is communication long before serious problems arise. In other parts of our lives, we'd call it teamwork. I understand and hope that reforms in this way, in this area, are underway. Let me conclude by applauding those of you who have joined together to take your concerns directly to a meeting of the full board of directors. I'd strongly encourage you not to retreat from the specific request in your letter for a meeting with all members of the board. Otherwise, you'll have a discussion with only the Eisner loyalists who will filter your concerns back to the board. The entire board needs to be fully engaged in this important dialogue. I further urge you to probe deeply and specifically in your questions and their answers to get beyond the usual cliches and generalities. Their message should not and cannot be simply a replay, replay of what you were told prior to and at the March 3rd shareholder meeting. They could at least turn the temperature up in there. Ask for the substance on the critical issues of performance, and I mean long-term performance, accountability, and succession. Since you all serve varied constituents, I further urge you to be mindful of your principal role as investors. The Walt Disney Company is using shareholder resources with their government relations staff and lobbyists in a full court press to push all the political buttons. We'd be happy to help you in preparing for this meeting by sharing ideas and information we'd, we've learned from other shareholders during our campaign. It's our hope that each of these attendees would find these materials helpful as they embark on the very important task of making sure shareholders are heard, making sure the board listens, and most importantly, making sure the board and management are held accountable for long-term performance. And so again, as I asked at the beginning, what does it take to convince the good people who compose boards to do the right thing, to understand that they're caretakers of a public trust, not of a private fiefdom, to focus their fiduci on their fiduciary duties to all the shareholders. The, indeed, the question is, what should it take? So once again, thanks to CII and each of you for your time and the opportunity to speak with you today. I think we have time for a few questions, and uh, my colleagues, Gene Krieger and Mike McConnell, are available as well. Thank you very much. Can you hear us okay? I have a question back there. Uh, can you hear from can you hear from here? Yeah. Got it? Congratulations first off, I think, on a very successful campaign. Thank um you. My, Lawn, Andrew Shapiro, Lawndale Capital Management. Um, I would would like to uh, questions for Roy, I think. Um, how would you describe the CEO succession plan and planning at Disney from your experience, um, uh, which was fairly recent there, and could you share your views of how it ought to work? Um, it's been publicized, I guess, that uh, the succession planning at the, am I being heard? I don't, I'm not here. This is the only hot one? Okay. Oh, all right. We can, we can deal with this. We're, we're pros. We ought to be able to do this. Um, succession planning at Disney uh, in, in recent years during Michael Eisner's time there, uh, as we have asked for information on it uh, and, and what we've gotten by way of feedback has been 
that in his desk drawer is a sealed envelope with the name of somebody in it. Um, I'm not making that up. Uh, if, if pressed on uh, whose name that is in there, nobody to my knowledge has ever learned. Uh, we began agitating uh, at least two years ago, probably three or four is closer, uh, to begin some kind of a succession process within the board with, frankly, no success. Uh, we are now told since our campaign began and since the agitation began to be a public matter that uh, uh, there is a process in motion to uh, name a successor. And I, I think it, 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 it's really worth mentioning that the problem is it goes beyond just who might replace Michael Eisner if he leaves or gets hit by a truck or whatever happens. Uh, the whole company suffers from this same problem because there are, there is and has never been a program where managers are responsible for their own succession plans within their own departments. Uh, so the whole company suffers from this kind of, well, you know, if somebody's eventually going to get hit by a truck, and what are we going to do with that particular division? Is, is that an answer to the question you asked? I, I think that answered the first part, which is what, what your view, you know, your experience is and what exists now, and now, if you could share your views of what, how you feel it ought to work. Uh, well, I think it ought to work. Uh, uh, well, I hope they're actually really doing what, the, what George Mitchell has said they're doing, which is beginning the process of creating a successor plan. And, and uh, of course, we've not been privy to that. We've been on the outside re recently. Uh, so I hope they are going at it in a businesslike and dispassionate way. Let me add one thing, if I may. In our discussions with other uh, shareholders, and our own view uh, has been that a much broader management development and succession plan is necessary at the Walt Disney Company where uh, critical positions are populated by people not only for uh, what they can do currently but really with a view to what their prospects for further advancement are. And that's one thing I think that Roy has been outspoken about and seeing that the succession plan goes much, much deeper in a management development approach uh, that looks to long-term career development and long-term succession planning. Great, that was very helpful, thank you. Hi, my name is Cynthia Richardson. Uh, I'm with the Ohio Public Employees Retirement System. My question for Mr. Disney uh, is two-part. Uh, first, uh, I've been told by the Disney, or we've been told by the Disney Company that they're interpreting the 24% withhold vote against uh, Mr. Mitchell as a voice of the shareholders to separate the CEO and chair positions, which they've already done. Uh, we have, and I know other shareholders have continuing concerns about Mr. Mitchell's independence, whether it's actual or perceived, due to long-standing uh, financial ties to the company. Uh, even though he technically meets the uh, the definition under the New York Stock Exchange of, of independent director. Uh, my question is, since you have been on the board with him, uh, what is your perception of Mitch, Mr. Mitchell's independence and his business expertise, given the other boards he sat on where there's been trouble, Xerox, financial restatements, stables, uh, U.S. technologies, etc. Uh, and it, the second part of my question is, in your opinion, uh, after comments about Mr. Mitchell, uh, is there anyone on the Disney board at the present time that you think is sufficiently independent to fulfill the role of chair? Okay. Um, um, the 24 percent vote, of course, against George Mitchell was, was a startling number and in the absence of the 43 percent against Michael Eisner, I think, would have caused uh, quite a reaction around the country. As it was, it, uh, it kind of got lost in the shuffle, uh, sadly. I think it reflects very clearly on um, a lot of our shareholders' uneasiness about George's track record as a corporate director. He's got a wonderful track record, we've said it over and over again, as a politician, as a statesman, both in our country and, and outside. And uh, we're very, I happen to be very familiar with his work in Ireland and, and respect enormously what he accomplished there. Um, 
but that unfortunately doesn't translate as into into the business world and his track record which is well known outside of the Disney company and other companies is is not a very heartwarming one um, the fact that it seems to have inspired the board to appoint him chairman seems to me to be a bad decision uh, and I certainly didn't approve of it and I think there were a lot of others who, who didn't as well um, and I think that sort of what you asked about the, my view of Mitchell is there anyone on the board today as it's presently constituted no in my view I think I think I do not I think if we're going to bring in a new CEO that we must look outside and, and excuse me for using the word we I don't work there anymore thank you uh, let me just add one one comment because um, uh, we understand that Judith Estrin yesterday uh, indicated that uh, you have to be a forensic scientist to understand what the vote meant. And quite simply, we don't think you need a PhD to un understand what 43 percent is. It's pretty simple arithmetic and it's considerably less complex than counting chads in Florida. But uh, more importantly, uh, I think it's the board's failure to respond with real change is offensive to those of you who work very hard on corporate governance issues. Uh, picking up from what Roy said in his comments, if 43 percent isn't sufficient, what is? What is the appropriate standard to affect change? Is it 50 percent, 62 percent? I think you have to ask yourself again, what really does it take to uh, cause a board to get into uh, the kind of action that this vote suggests? Good morning. My name is Shuman Ray with the Communications Workers of America Pension Fund. I had a question, uh, the same question I actually asked Director uh, Estran yesterday, which is when as a large shareholder of uh, the Walt Disney Company, how, how, would you, you know, how would you think about the Comcast bid to acquire Disney in terms of the mix between price and corporate governance? The response we basically got yesterday was, uh, uh, was that you know, the board didn't really consider the corporate governance issues because the price wasn't high enough. Where do you, where do you stand on that issues? And, looking at Comcast and as well as the corporate governance structure there? Uh, I, I, the, our first reaction was the same as theirs, which was that the offer was, was a bit of a lowball offer. Um, and, and we certainly are aware that Comcast has its own governance issues and, and, and uh, that certainly would create complications in, in, in some deal given that, that, that one actually did get made. Uh, I have all long said because Steve Burke uh, worked at Disney for 12 years and we knew Steve quite well during those years and he worked at the Disney stores and in uh, uh, Paris Disneyland and at ABC and of course he grew his dad was uh, involved in ABC as Tom Murphy's partner right from the beginning so he knows that business I think pretty well having grown up around it uh, Steve Burke, if I can isolate him out from all of those other questions you just asked, would be an enormous asset to the Disney Company, in my view. Uh, but but that's not really an answer to the question. But it, it it's it is a perspective on how, at least I personally have have looked at it. Tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern, a look at the Three Mile Island.